No en ambas. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Okay, so uh, yeah, so um, this is uh, the the workshop on um, <clears throat> Hodge theory, mirror symmetry, and physics of Calabria moduli, and uh, it's a joint workshop of Match at Heidelberg and uh, Pips uh, in Western Canada, and uh, it's the second workshop they've organized in this uh, sort of framework. The first one was two years ago on um, a different topic. Um, and um, yeah, so I uh, look forward to um, many interesting talks and um, probably some practical announcement, you know, from time to time. But I think for the time being, we should try to uh, get going with the program. And uh, first, uh, we asked uh, Gebhard Berkler, colleague and uh, uh, acting director of MATCH, to say a few words of uh, welcome. Yes, uh, so um, hello everyone. So <clears throat> Johannes convinced me to say a few words on behalf of uh, Match, and uh, so I look, I mean, I see that you all made it well here and that's uh, great to uh, welcome you all in Heidelberg. And so I um, want to welcome everyone here to the workshop on Hutch theory, mirror, mirror symmetry and physics of Calabi-Yau moduli. And uh, so the workshop is funded jointly by Match Hymns and uh, Structures. And uh, as you all know, organized uh, by uh, Johannes Nwalcher, Simone Neuer, and uh, Charles Doran. And now I, thank you. Ah, <laughs> good. <laughs> I actually didn't know all the organizers. Um, and so before I let you dive deeply into the talks of the workshop, uh, let me say a few words about the Mathematics Center Heidelberg, um, which I guess is abbreviated by Mitch. So this was founded about 15 years ago, and an important aim then was to coordinate research um, activities, I mean, to, to coordinate the research activities and to have a more outside visibility of the Heidelberg mathematics. And at the time, 15 years ago, um, mathematics was spread out in three buildings, uh, not near here, but somewhere on the campus. So it was the Mathematical Institute, the Institute for Applied Mathematics, and the Interdisciplinary Center for Scientific Computing. And uh, I don't even remember, but I remember that the <laughs> Mathematics Institute was in the oldest building on campus, and the other one were in some temporary buildings that were temporary for 25 years. So, <laughs> or maybe longer, maybe they're still there. Um, and uh, so, <clears throat> fortunately, some generous donor um, made possible that we have this new building in which we can now host this conference. And uh, um, so since 2016, we all moved in here. So all of mathematics, uh, the interdisciplinary center of scientific computing and even the computer science people, we all found a new location. And uh, now that we have this new building, I guess the space is running low again. So yeah, so <laughs> we have to soon expand again. Um, <clears throat> And uh, also I should mention that a few weeks ago, um, so until then we were two mathematics sub-departments, the Mathematical Institute and the Institute for Applied Mathematics. And so we joined uh, forces uh, early April to become the uh, new Institute of Mathematics. So, um, maybe I should also then go to another point. So another aim of MATCH back in 2008 was to support many new hirings in mathematics. I think in 2008, it was clear that the next 15 years, many people would retire and uh, new positions would be refilled. And this was possible due to um, the role of mathematics in the first two rounds of the German Excellence Initiative. And in the last 15 years, I guess nearly all of the then existing faculty was replaced by new faculty. So there was a, <coughs> a complete, uh, Turnaround. And an important aspect of this process of renewal was to possibly strengthen the links between math and physics. This was one of the goals, and uh, this might bring most of you here at this point. So <clears throat> I think this was a very good initiative. And um, so, as part of this effort, it was possible to hire Johannes here as a faculty. And uh, there was also a new partnership initiative between math and physics in 2015. And uh, I think this became one of the pillars of the many pillars that proved important for the success of the um, structural cluster at Heidelberg that has 
Uh, that is funded since around 2019 by the German Excellence Strategy and brings together math and physics in many ways and I guess also supports this workshop. And uh, since 2019, so I guess we achieved all the goals. Uh, <laughs> we had to look for some new things, no way. But, uh, so <clears throat> since 2019, maybe the new uh, emphasis of math is on strengthening like international collaboration and uh, it was an uh, excellent possibility to have uh, joined, uh, I mean, to, um, to, I mean, to um, have uh, joined events with the PIMS in Canada and also with other German universities, I think, next to Heidelberg, there are also Münster and Berlin um, involved in this. Um, and uh, in fact, so I think in 2019, there was a conference here um, between PIMS and uh, Berlin and uh, Münster on uh, analysis, modeling, and numerics. So this was one of the areas. I think in 2021, and now there is a workshop here in mathematical physics <clears throat> organized by Johannes and I think the same people back then. And uh, there was also a, another area where we have to see a lot of collaborations, namely the arithmetic geometry and number theory group that just uh, this um, March had a workshop on uh, eigenvarieties and adding spaces. So I think there are a lot of collaborations now taking place um, between PIMS and <clears throat> Heidelberg and other German institutions. So I hope this gives you an impression of the initiatives supported by MATCH. Um, certainly MATCH was not the unique player on this. Uh, there were definitely many players of this. And uh, in any case, I should also say that I only got involved in this after all the successful stuff was done. So I'm only here to give an introductory speech. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, um, but um, maybe even though we were not maybe at the base of all these uh, important developments, I mean, we were one of the things, but maybe having match as a center might have led people to develop new visions. And uh, I think only with new visions, uh, new developments and new progress will be possible. And uh, so let me end on this now maybe, and let me now wish you a successful workshop with excellent talks, uh, lots of interactions, and uh, hopefully many new visions and insights and uh, I hope you enjoy uh, your time in Heidelberg in many ways. Thank you. And I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, on behalf of PIMS, uh, I'd like to, to welcome friends old and new uh, to, to Heidelberg. Um, one of my main jobs this week is to talk to Johannes about a follow-up event or events in Canada. And um, yeah, so if you have ideas, share them with us. And, and, uh, we'll work on that next. So then, um, Dr. Ruthie, you know, but, but, but does he need this for the microphone? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, while Matt's getting geared up, um, our first speaker is, is um, Matt Kerr from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and he's giving part one of a two part talk with Russell Golishev. Yeah, <laughs> Seems the volume is quite high. Or maybe that needs to be turned off. But it does seem very high in volume. Okay. Can everyone hear me on the Zoom? Thumbs up. Okay, great.
Okay, um, let's see. The title of my talk is Differential Equations, Hypergeometric Families, and Algebraic Cycles. Um, and the main theme is that you can use differential equations uh, often to bypass constructions of cycles and evaluation of their Abel Jacobi maps for purposes of computing Abel Jacobi maps, um, regulator maps, higher normal function construction, and checking the balance and conjectures possibly. Um, and uh, this is, as Chuck said, the first in a two talk series, the second of which will be given by Vasily. So I'm gonna start by saying a few words about Frobenius deformations. So here, M over P1 with coordinate Z minus some finite set sigma, um, which I'll call U, will be a variation of Hodge structure of weight n, all the Hodge numbers are one, so it's rank n plus one. And I'm gonna give myself a section um, that is nowhere zero on the affine line, only has zeros at infinity. So this uniquely specifies this section once I impose an additional uh, scaling. So this is the canonical extension of M globally. This is the nth, uh, the top Hodge filtration. Um, I'm going to assume that I have various things about monodromy. So this set here is going to include zero and infinity, as well as C equals C1 up through CD. So this C will be less than or equal to an absolute value, all of the other CIs. Those are all conifold points. And I have maximal unipotent monodromy at Z equals zero and conifold, meaning Picard Lefschetz monodromy at Z equals CI for each I. And for all the monodromies for, for sigma and sigma, T sigma will be written the semi-simple part times the unipotent part. Okay. Um, so now I need to tell you what form the differential equation takes. We have a differential equation, differential operator rather, of degree D. So I can write it as Z to the J polynomials in D where D is Z D D Z. I can also write it as sum as i goes from zero uh, to n plus one, it has order n plus one, q n plus one minus i of z d to the i, and this thing is in c of z d. So the q's and p's are all polynomials. Um, and of course, the important thing is to have that l kills mu as a class, and so then, L is going to kill all periods. And what are those periods gonna look like? Well, I'm gonna start with taking the dual local system of M, right? It's a variation, it's a Q variation of Hodge structure. So it has a Q local system. And then I take a base point P not in Sigma and I take the T naught invariance. So this is like invariant homology classes about zero. And that will be generated by a single cycle because I have maximal unipotent monodromy. And then I have for the conifold monodromy TC minus I applied to MP dual is generated by a single conifold cycle delta. And so then I claim, I'm not gonna prove that's true. There exists unique um, basis of MP check consisting of epsilon not up through epsilon n, such that uh, n epsilon m equals epsilon m minus one, 
And all the ones except for epsilon zero are invariant about the conical point. Okay. And so then L kills the periods. These are the Betty periods. Epsilon M is the integral over var epsilon M of mu. So those are my Betty periods that have something to do with geometry. And I want to ask a basic question. How to solve the differential equation L of blah equals Z to the one over R for some integer R okay, in this setup. So here is a proposition um, that comes out of work by Bloch Blasenko and a follow-up paper I wrote, just those abbreviations. I can restrict M to a punctured disk about the origin. And then the claim is that this extends to a unique variation of mixed Hodge structure, B over the same thing um, with Hodge numbers, they're mixed Hodge numbers in the following diagram. So we start with the Hodge numbers of M and now we're going to extend them like this to get a variation of mixed Hodge structure with negative minus one, minus one, minus two, minus two. All of those mixed Hodge numbers are one. Um, differential equation, D infinity L. So if M as a D module is D mod DL, this is D mod D infinity L. Um, the idea is you apply L to a class in here and that kills the stuff up here, but then you still have to keep applying D to kill everything. Um, local system uh, V closed under TC. I'm not saying it extends to a, a variation of mixed hot structure on P1 minus sigma, but we at least have this. Um, and then that's the uniqueness statement. And then there are further statements. VP check has a basis, epsilon M, M greater than or equal to zero with TC epsilon M equals epsilon M and um, N naught epsilon M equals epsilon M minus one for all M bigger than zero. And uh, we can encode this. You can ignore the table. You know. We encode this set of mixed Betty periods, if you will, by a E of SZ, this is gonna be a generating series. What do we satisfy? We have TC minus I applied to E is psi of Z, which is the integral of mu over a manifold cycle. So that's the first statement. T naught of E is E to the two pi I S E and L E, the current Fuchs operator in Z um, gives S to the N plus one times some power series alpha of S times Z to the S where alpha of S takes the form one plus O of alpha of S. Plus O of S. Okay, so it's some complicated generating series, and I can also rewrite it formally as A K of S Z to the K plus S. Now this looks pretty mysterious, but I'm going to tell you what it is explicitly in one case. So in the hypergeometric setting, where D is equal to one, that's the order. Uh, sorry, the degree of the differential operator and number of conifold points. So sigma can be taken to be zero, one infinity, L to be D to the N plus one minus Z times the product, J goes from one to N plus one, D minus some AJs. So those are some coefficients typically between, typically between zero and one and symmetric under reflection about a half, but one doesn't have to insist that but you can assume that. Then AK of S is 
the product over J of gamma of K plus S plus AJ over gamma of AJ times gamma of K plus S plus one. And the leading period epsilon naught of, of Z, uh, which by the way, um, mu is specified completely uh, by assuming that always epsilon not begins with one. So this is the sum k greater than or equal to zero, a k zero, z to the k is for these a k of zeros. They're simply given in terms of gamma functions, or you can rewrite them in terms of Pockheimer symbols, a plus one z to the k. And the moral of this is that the classical Frobenius method uh, actually encodes Betty periods. So what do I mean by that? I mean, you start with this hypergeometric series. Then you formally write, you formally replace k everywhere by k plus s. And that gives you the generating series of these. And then the statement is that recovers all these mixed Betty periods by taking der derivatives with respect to S and setting S equal to zero repeatedly. And so this gives you the Betty periods, not some Frobenius periods, which I'll discuss in a moment, but it tells you geometry without having geometry at hand. So that's the magic of this. Now I believe, what do I need to get this thing? Where the right hand side, ah, not so. Okay, so, so these epsilon m's from epsilon zero up to epsilon n are killed by L. But for higher, uh, that's no longer true. And you can see that already from L e gives s to the n plus one times some series times z to the s. So you see, as soon as you go above m equals n, when you go to m equals n plus one, you start getting mixed periods. And so then there are solutions to dl, d squared l, d cubed l, and so on and so forth. What was the spreading period question? Uh, not yet. I have to tell you how to solve, how to, how to do that question. Yeah. The question is, what can I erase? Erase maybe up here. Okay, so now um, we want to take epsilon of SZ divided by alpha of S and call this phi of SZ. And if I formally write this as phi M of Z S to the M, then these are called Frobenius periods. And they are uh, sort of, you can uniquely specify them more or less by saying, or you can characterize them by saying this. Okay. So there are a lot of interesting constant terms in the analytic parts of the epsilon Ms. These don't happen. Um, and accordingly, this alpha of S, though I don't have time to say anything about this, is telling you something about the limiting mixed Hodge structure, not just of M, but of the whole variation of mixed Hodge structure V and V origin. So it's, it's power series coefficients tell you the entire limiting period matrix in effect. So phi can be in fact uniquely specified by the properties L phi is S to the N plus one, Z to the S and T naught phi is e to the two pi i s phi. And then this leads to proposition two immediately just by looking at that. And that is that if I put w r of z to be r to the n plus one phi one over r z, um, this is 
the unique solution of L of blah equals Z to the one over R um, with WR of zero equals zero. And here's again, the hypergeometric example, WR of Z is some K greater than or equal to zero product over J of Polkhammer symbols, alpha J plus one over R K over one over R K plus one Z to the K plus one over R. Okay. So I'm gonna leave that world for a second and tell you what a higher normal function is. So I'm gonna start with a slightly different notation. So let H over U, still the same U, a different H, different variation, be a variation of Hodge structure of weight W less than zero. Then a higher normal function uh, on U with uh, values in H, is equivalently either of the two things, a variation of mixed Hodge structure of the form zero goes to H, goes to E, goes to Q of zero, goes to zero, so short exact sequence of mixed Hodge structures, or a holomorphic horizontal section of J of H, which means uh, H, with complex coefficients over F not H plus the Q local system. So sort of bundle of generalized intermediate Jacobians. Uh, the way you go between these things is you take a lift of one from here to F not EC and to the local system over Q, you take their difference that lands in here. And so you get something in the numerator there and you quotient by F not H and H to excise the ambiguities in that lift, okay? So it, it is admissible, I'm just gonna keep things simple here, with respect to P1, if and only if all the limiting mixed Hodge structures of the variation of mixed Hodge structure E exist, okay? If those all exist, and I will write, new for my higher normal function in a n f u of h and i'll also write e you can write e new for the uh, extension you can write new for the section of j of h etc cetera, etc cetera. um and this new um has invariants they're called singularity invariants sing uh sigma of new at each point in the discriminant locus that lies in hum, Q of zero, this is hum mixed Hodge structures, psi sigma of H, which is my shorthand for the limit mixed Hodge structure. Okay. And here the idea is you take a local lift of nu about sigma, and then you apply N sigma, the monodromy logarithm. Okay, um, and I'll need a slightly more sophisticated notation. So for U not uh, containing U and contained in P1, I'm going to set A and F U not of H to be those admissible normal functions such that Sing sigma of nu is zero for all sigma in u naught intersect sigma. Then there are a bunch of facts that are useful for working with these things. These look very mysterious, but you can compute readily. So 
W less than negative one, that's the true higher normal function case. Admissible normal functions with no singularities at all are just zero because I'm working modular torsion. If W equals one minus one, that's the classical normal function case. And then all admissible normal functions um, have no singularities. It's sort of the opposite. It uh, presents difficulties in going back and forth between those two cases. Um, and then A and F U naught of H, and this is how you actually compute these things. There's a class of an admissible normal function, which lands in POM Q of zero into IH1 parabolic cohomology of H on U naught. And if you're used to thinking about parabolic cohomology on all of P1, that's always pure. This is not, because I'm, this is not on all of P1. There exist exact sequences, zero to IH1, P1H, to IH1, uh, U naught, H, to the direct sum over all sigma in the complement of U naught, that's sigma naught, um, um, psi sigma of H, limit mixed touch structure, T sigma co-invariance twisted by minus one. And then finally, there's the Euler-Poincaré formula, which says that the dimension of IH1 of U naught H is the sum over sigma in U naught intersect sigma, delta sigma minus rank H times the Euler characteristic of U naught, where delta sigma is the rank of T sigma minus the identity. Okay. Now, I want to take um, an admissible normal function over GM, so no singularities apart from zero and infinity, with values in M twisted by P. So now I'm back to my original weight N variation twisted by P. So this is isomorphic to um, HOM Q of minus P into IH1 GM M for, let's say P is between N plus one over two and N plus one. Those are the values it can possibly take. And I'll take a multi-valued lift mu tilde so you think of this, you think of mu as being a section of some generalized Jacobian bundle, and I could just take a multi-valued lift to the variation v, uh, h, in this case, m. And um, so this is a lift to m on the universal cover. And then I put v for the resulting multi-valued function in z, which is I take this lift, Evaluated at z and pair against mu of z. Remember that was the section of the Hodge line bundle. Um, and finally, I'm going to write f n e m e. Um, that's a line bundle on P1, so it has some degree h. This will almost this will basically always be one for us. Then the punchline. Proposition three, this comes from a paper with Vasily and my student Tokyo Sasaki, postdoc in Miami now. Um, the inhomogeneous term LV, so I take this higher normal function V and I hit it with L, that gives not just a rational function, this is a polynomial of degree less than or equal to D minus H. And if the singularity invariant of nu at zero is zero, then T divides G, sorry, Z divides G. Um, 
And you can say other things like if the entire setup, if the variation comes from a variety, a family of varieties defined over Q bar, then G is a polynomial with coefficients in Q bar. Um, and if the higher normal function is not identically zero, then G is not identically zero. So, so here are some examples. If D is one, so we're back in the hypergeometric case essentially, then IH1 of GM M is one, just because the drop at each conifold point is one. So you count the number of conifold points that gives you the dimension of this. And um, psi naught M coinvariance uh, at the origin is just a Q of minus N minus one because I have maximal unipotent monodromy. So I just look at the top of the N string and that has weight 2n, and then I twist by additional minus one. Uh, so that gives you that IH1 GM M is IH1 P1 minus zero, M is Q of minus N minus one. And so that means that P is N plus one, and the it has a singularity at zero, and LV is some constant. So if we go now to D equals two, then one of two things can happen. Either we have an exact sequence, IH1 P1 M to IH1 GM M to this Q of minus N minus one, which persists to this case, that comes from singularity at the origin. Um, and this says that you're going to have a non-trivial classical normal function. The other possibility is that IH1 GM M is the covariance at zero plus the covariance at infinity. And these both have rank one. And this will be again, a Q of minus N minus one because of the mum. And this will be some Q of minus P. And so we want to understand um, this situation. So coming from the normal function coming from this class, let's call it V naught, is going to satisfy L V naught equals C naught. And by this proposition, the normal function coming from this class, because it has no singularity at zero, will look like, let's call it V infinity, C infinity times Z, where both of these in our constructions will be uh, in Q bar. Okay. So we sort of get out of thin air motivic solutions to these inhomogeneous equations. So where do these come from geometrically? They come from regulator maps on algebraic cycles, but not usual algebraic cycles, rather higher cycles, unless you're in this case. So this is the geometric realization part. We have X over P1, Palabia infold family, and it's uh, HN, let's say XU over U, contains our M as an irreducible subvariation. Um, now, a, an admissible normal function over some U naught with coefficients in M of A as class, just write it like this. Class of new is in, we're going to shorten hom q of zero into something to hodge, hodge classes in IH1 u naught m of a in hodge classes in IH1. Well, let's say actually this lives in H n plus one x u naught q of a. Well, then the balance and Hodge conjecture 
tells us that such a class, such a Hodge class, should have a geometric realization of the form Z in a typical cohomology in degree n plus one, x u naught, q of a. Maybe you, if you're more comfortable with higher chow notation, here is that. This tells you the sort of degree of K theory that we were in, um, twisted by Q, with cycle class of Z equals the class of a normal function. And so then that tells us that restricting to fibers, Abel Jacobi on XZ of, I'll write just ZZ for the restriction to, to fiber XZ, um, which is represented by classes of regulator currents associated to these cycles um, recovers new, uh, it's called new, new Z as it comes from that in the Jacobian of M and A. Okay, so taking fiber-wise Abel Jacobi of these higher cycles gives us our normal function back. And now what does the balance and conjecture say? The first balance and conjecture says that if X over Q is an N fold, B equals two A minus N minus one is at least two. And script X is an integral model. Then if I look at cycles extending to the integral model, or if you prefer chow A of XB, then this has Abel Jacobi maps to J of H and M of X Q of A, which is H N of X C over F A of that plus that with Q of A coefficients. And I can project that to the real Deline cohomology H N of X R of A minus one over F A plus F A bar. And now inside that, there are the so-called Durham invariants, which is what you get by composing complex conjugation on the points of X together with conjugation of coefficients. And then if I look at um, extension of this to R, this is supposed to be an isomorphism. So let's call that RB. And the conjecture furthermore says uh, exactly what the ranks of the two sides are. So the rank of K A B of X should be the order of vanishing at N plus one minus A of the L function. And for N odd, this can be computed by looking at the Archimedean parts of the gamma, uh, the Archimedean parts of the L function. N plus one minus A less than or equal to P less than or equal to N minus one over two HP N minus P. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. And then um, the leading Taylor coefficient for which you have to differentiate this many times of the L function at N plus one minus A is equivalent up to Q cross to the determinant of RB and this determinant is taken with respect to the Q structure defined by the determinant of the Durham invariance in here by the determinant of the algebraic Durham cohomology FA HM Durham X over Q. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I am. A, I do want to assume that's defined over Q bar, actually over Q, so that when I spe specialize to uh, integer points in there, I have an integral model of some kind, or to rational points. I mean, okay. So let me just do a quick example. So if X is Klabiao three, Hodge numbers are one, 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 and 
L of S means L of H3 of X S, then we're supposed to have that the second derivative of L at zero is up to a, a rational constant, the determinant of a two by two matrix given by, we take the valence and regulator of two cycles um, divided by two pi i cubed, and you integrate them. So here's Z1 and Z2 are supposed to be a basis in K44 of the integral model and gamma one and gamma two are a basis um, for the F infinity covariance. That's the uh, complex conjugation. Okay. And uh, you can say something similar about L prime at one, uh, and that has to do with K2 of X, but it's a bit more complicated to state and Vasily will say something about that. This is all I need for now. How much longer do I have you on this? Okay, that's for 45 minutes. Yes, okay. All right, 10 to 15. Uh, yeah, yeah. I want to say one more thing about geometric realization. It's important because there's a case where you always have um, a KN plus one cycle for free. And this goes back to uh, in the case of K2 of elliptic curves work of Fernando Rodriguez Viegas and then for KN general uh, work I did with Jack Doran. So we have the notion of a tempered Laurent polynomial. Um, so we assume that our Laurent polynomial is defined over Q bar in N plus one variables. It cuts out an N fold, but what I want to do is take its Newton polytope, assume that's reflexive, and then take one minus T phi of X equals zero and take its closure inside some blow up of the associated torque variety cross P1. And then I have a section of the Hodge line bundle given by one over two pi I to the N res xt of the wedge of all the d logs of the coordinates over one minus t phi. That gives holomorphic forms and that extends across the canonical extension as well. Now I take the symbol x1 through xn plus one that lives in kn plus one, n plus one, or if you prefer, this motivic homology group. And this, we assume this lifts, we assume all these are assumptions, assume this lifts to a class C in HN plus one motivic of X minus the fiber over zero Q N plus one. Then we call phi tempered. And finally, we assume that our, if you look at HN X U over U that contains our M, as a one one subvariation, so there exists some subvariation of that type in there, um, and we set v not equal to a lift of the associated uh, higher normal function paired against mu, and uh, this automatically satisfies the following things: class of c equals nu c is in Hodge of i. H1, P1 minus zero, M N plus one, and L V naught equals C naught is some non-zero constant, um, and also nabla D of the 
regulator classes of psi gives mu on the nose. And so what you can say here, since mu satisfies L, you can sort of say that R satisfies uh, LD, whereas V naught satisfies DL. So you sort of, you have the Frobenius uh, duals, the Frobenius dual operators, and that corresponds to dual extensions of the original variation pod structure. Okay, so finally, I'm ready for this table. What does the table mean? Those are the 14 hypergeometric cases summarized, where the 14 hypergeometric cases come from originally uh, Duran Morgan classification. We have 14 hypergeometrics with mom at zero and a single conical point at one. So Basili will uh, tell you a little bit about examples with no mum, orphans, but I won't. Um, so the assumptions are M has type one, 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 D equals one equals H, H was the degree of the Hodge line. And they all have tempered models. One of them is singular tempered model, no matter. Um, with a four class, C in Cha four of X minus X naught comma four, just like above. Okay. And now we have an order two. This is where the magic happens. There's an order two pullback that we're going to do where I take the coordinate on the upstairs P1 to be Z hat, that goes to Z hat squared equals Z. And then I take upper star of M and call that M hat. And the point is that you get cycles with values in M hat that you don't get with values in M. This has degree D equals two, but still H equals one because there's this mysterious fact that the Deline canonical extension does not pull back under finite monodromies unless all the monodromies, well, under finite base change, unless the monodromies are all unipotent, which they're not here. Um, so there's a second, there's a second higher normal function in addition to the one here um, of the form LV infinity equals C infinity Z hat, which is C infinity square root of Z. So now I'm going back to the beginning of the talk with R equals two and looking at things that satisfy this inhomogeneous equation, L of law equals Z to the half. Okay. Now, assuming the balance and Hodge conjecture, we should expect cycles as in the table. Okay, so let's go through the table. First, you have um, the case of just finite monodromy at infinity, which is called 1A. There are seven cases like that. So the limit mixed hot structure type is pure. The co-invariants at infinity are zero. There aren't any. So that means that you get an extra classical function. And these have been found in many cases. They should be K naught cycles. They've been found in many cases by Johannes Walser, together with some people, Morris and Kreffel. Um, type 2b, you have, after you do some order base change, something that looks like conifold monodromy at infinity. So the co-invariance, um, there's always a half a half in the middle. So if you do just the order two base change, you get a co-invariance 
twisted by minus one of type Q of minus three. So you predict, predict A equals three and a K2 cycle. And so as far as I'm aware, these have yet to be constructed, um, but we sort of know what to do. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the last case because I'm running out of time. Uh, type two, again, you don't have finite monodromy at infinity, but there are no co-invariants because there's nothing, there's no half there. And so the upshot is you again expect a classical normal function and Johannes has done these cases if I understand correctly. Um, and then type four is the last one. And in some ways it's the simplest, but in some ways it's the most mysterious. So you have this, after you pull back a mum at infinity. So mum at zero and a mum at infinity and a Q of minus four at infinity as well as at zero. And so there should be two K4 cycles, one emanating from zero with a singularity there, one emanating from infinity with a singularity there. And by the uniqueness result, um, in all cases, we have a formula for V infinity. It's given by W2, right? Without even knowing if there's a cycle, we can say this V infinity of Z is W2 of Z is C infinity square root of Z, sum K greater than or equal to zero, product J equals one to four. Of these Pockheimer symbols, half. K plus one fourth, um, Z to the K. That seems of interest for interpreting <clears throat> results in open mirror symmetry. Jonas and I have discussed this. Um, but what about for the balance in conjectures? For the balance in conjectures, you can use the fact that dr of the cycle emanating from zero is equal to mu to compute, for example, this period of the regulator class. This is gonna be two pi i to the n log t uh, plus some k greater than zero of constants and powers of the Laurent polynomial, which will again be things like this, just some slight variation there on. And then you can find um, uh, epsilon two or epsilon one, epsilon j's by Frobenius deformations, um, and, uh, appending an s to k and differentiating and setting s to zero. But we really only know, um, we have a second, like suppose we wanted to check the valence and conjecture one for k4. We have exactly one class where we have, a case where we have two k4 classes. And so there's one case where we can try to check valence and conjecture one right away. And that is this case four. Um, there are two tempered models. Let me just tell you one of them. So upstairs, we have one minus t hat phi hat equals zero, where phi hat is product as i goes from one to four of xi plus xi inverse. Um, that's, well, okay, you can do minus. It doesn't change the, anything. And then there exists a birational involution, i from x hat to x hat over, I'm switching back and forth between z and t. Uh, one is just an integer multiple of the other. I don't want to go into details. So here, x1 through x4 goes to one plus x2 over one minus x2 minus uh, one minus x1 over one plus x1, and so on. We just do the same thing with the third and fourth coordinates. Um, and you take curly z to be the pullback by this birational involution of c. So the cycle emanating from infinity is just the, pull, the base chain, the pullback by i of the cycle emanating from zero. And then we can say, um, using formulas like this, um, and uh, from the fact that this is a base change of that, you get also nabla d r z is i over star mu up to some rational multiple equals z hat mu. And so this tells you right away that 
2 pi i to the minus 3 epsilon naught rz is square root of t sum k greater than or equal to 0, 2k choose k to the fourth over k plus a half t to the k, whereas 2 pi i to the minus 3 integral epsilon naught arc c is um, given by this thing, but with uh, 2k choose k to the fourth put in here. Okay, so I'm out of time, but let me just say the basic claim. At four points, namely z hat equals one over uh, one, a quarter, a sixteenth, and a sixty-fourth. Um, both cycles extend across um, an integral model of xz. And you need one of those four points um, basically because you, you end up in the integral model with the mum fiber appearing at some point and then you have a non-trivial residue for the cycle. And at those four points, z hat, let's make sure I have the right values, equals four for the plus or minus k. Yeah, that's one, two, three, and four, not at one. Then, um, Z and C in chow for X4 um, and balance and conjecture numerically checks out. And that is the point from which Vasily will take it. Thank you. Very much. Um, we have time for one question. Okay, question. All right, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, but that uh, case, chow for pi comma four, uh, the balance of the hot trajectory should hold for varieties over complex numbers. So over complex numbers. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But this is the, this is balance and conjecture one. This is yeah. the right. Okay. This yeah. is the special value of the L function. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, so we've constructed the two cycles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm claiming that more is true. And actually, you didn't need the cycles to check the balance and conjecture one. That's the whole weird thing about this. You could do everything with differential equations and iterated integrals and so on. Right. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, let us take Matt again. And there's um, copy and refreshments in the common room. And let's say we reconvene, let's say at 1045. <laughs> Thank you. Great start.